What's up guys, John here and welcome back to John Moon Studios. Thank you for tuning in to episode 3 of my Inside My Music series. Let's get right to it. All right, so that was the entire two minute piece. Now we're gonna go ahead and break down some of the sections here. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is the strings. I'm using Hans Zimmer string short. So let's just go ahead and take a listen to it on its own. So on its own, you can hear that these strings have a lot of character. So there's not really much else I'm doing in this. It's literally just the same. As you, let me show you the MIDI information. This is all that's happening inside of the string part. So it's just repeating notes, uh, what we call ostinatos. Um, so it's just repeating notes, and I'm just going through a bunch of different chords using just Hans Zimmer strings short. Now let's go ahead and move on to the percussion section. This is East-West percussion, uh, Hollywood percussion, and this is Storm Drum 3, and then Hans Zimmer Timpani, which is part of the percussion package from Spitfire Audio. So we're gonna go ahead and listen to what the percussion is doing. Let me just solo all these, sorry. All right, so that's all that's happening pretty much in the beginning. Um, the the orchestra, uh, the, the the notes that are, are being repeated are, have their, their melody with it. So that's what's keeping the drive in this section of the song. So now we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next section. Um, we have some brass in here. So this is Hollywood Brass from East West. So let's take a listen to that. Right, so we have French horn, trumpet, trombones, and tuba. So you see how these notes swell? So in my previous video last week, I talked about how to make your orchestra sound realistic, and I mentioned that I use a nano, uh, my Nano Control 2 by Korg. 
uh, and it's pretty much a control, little control surface with faders and knobs, um, but I use it as an expression, a MIDI CC expression tool. And what I do is I assign my faders to specific MIDI CCs and I control expression um, at the same time as I'm recording the instruments on my keyboard. So let's go ahead and look at the expression controls here. So here you can see all of the expression data that I'm using and that's what's allowing me to create those swells. So I'm gonna go ahead and play a little bit for you so you can see it. Right? It's the only way you're going to get some life into these sample instruments because remember, even though these are real people being recorded, the samples are very lifeless if you don't add expression and dynamics to it because naturally we do it as humans when we're playing it. But for samples, they're actually taking just a long note and then replaying the long note in different dynamic levels, but they're not really giving it life. So you need to make sure that when you're doing... Uh, orchestral mock-ups or any kind of uh, sample work, you need to make sure that you use uh, some modulation or expression so you can give some life into these samples. Uh, and again, mostly for samples that are instruments, uh, electronic music like kicks and snares and stuff, you don't really use that. But for things like trumpets, orchestras, you know, flutes, if you have guitar samples, things like that, there might be some use of using the modulation control. Uh, an expression control to kind of give it more character. So we're gonna go ahead and move on. We're gonna see now how these instruments blend together. Again, in the percussion section, you're gonna hear two new instruments and I'll go ahead and point them out right now. So let's just take a listen really quick. Right, so you're hearing kind of like this metallic percussion sound, and that's the brake drum and anvils. So this is again east west, and all they're doing is having this like very simple, uh, I believe it's like eighth notes or sixteenth notes kind of rhythm. Let me pull up the MIDI information so you can see it. Right, so this is the brake drum and anvils, and then later on in the uh, in the arrangement here, we have concert toms. So let's hear how these sound. Right, so these are the concert toms. Again, they're east-west instruments. So the concert toms are just doing uh, a straight sixteenth notes. Notice how. The string ostinato pattern that we have here actually changes in this section as well. So let's go ahead and play just the strings and the percussion because I have something interesting going on here. Right? It kind of sounds like the, the, the strings and the percussion are talking to each other. And this is what we call, uh, you could either call it a call to response or question and response, uh, whatever you call it. But point is, the, the percussion is asking a question and then my strings are responding. So you hear da ba da ba dum bum bum So if you hear it again, it's very interesting how these two uh, sets of instruments kind of communicate with each other within the piece. Right? And then with all that happening, we have everything else kind of just being the accompaniment uh, over that, especially the other percussion instruments. And then we have the brass kind of embellishing the, the section. So let's take a listen to everything together. Right, and now we jump into the next section. So in the next section, which is the final section, we have a harp, and this is, again, east-west harp. Um, it's doing a glissando, so let's see what's going on here. So the patch already comes with a glissando. I just kind of write in the chord I want it to play, and then it does everything else. So let's take a listen to it.
very mysterious. So we're going to go ahead and check out what's going on in the next uh, track here. This is the full strings tremolo. This is East West uh, Hollywood strings and it's a full, the full orchestra, uh, just strings though, the full orchestra doing tremolos. MIDI information. Alright, so tremolo is just the rapid succession of moving the bow up and down uh, on, on, on a specific note. And that's the, the effect that we have here. And then we have the Hans Zimmer strings. Now this is only the basses and cellos playing here. So it's kind of just doubling the, uh, the tremolo strings up high. We have the same thing, but in longs in the lower strings. So let's take a listen to both of them at the same time. kind of leaves you a little bit anxious. You kind of want to hear the next phrase already. So the reason why I did it like this is because I used both extremes of the frequency spectrum. I used the very lows and then I used the very highs because the brass section is going to take care of everything else in the middle. So let's take a listen to the brass. Uh, warning, it will sound very brutal. <laughs> so let's take a listen. Right, so the brass section, uh, as you can hear, it sounds very huge. And the reason why it also sounds huge is because we're doing, or not we're doing, but the samples, we can create what we call bell tones, right? I used to be a trumpet player, so I can explain this pretty thoroughly. Um, when you do a bell tone, you're, you're blowing a lot of pressure, right, into, the, into one note. And instead of getting a nice dark round sound, what you're doing is you're overloading the horn with air, therefore the, the sound kind of gets distorted a little bit, which is what you hear in the low brass, especially when you blow really hard into one note uh, without changing it, of course. Um, you're going to get this really like, distortion-y, gritty sound, and that's what's going on here. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the percussion, see what's going on here. Right, so not a lot of percussion happening here. To be honest, uh, there's it's not as much percussion as you think. Uh, usually when you think of Epic, you think of loads of percussion players just playing at the same time, but I didn't take that approach for the score. I actually let the brass do most of the work and kind of just left the, the, the percussion to accent specific parts of the Epic section and then the strings to kind of just create that tension. Uh, almost like anxious feeling. So let's go ahead and take a listen to the entire last section. And that's pretty much it. And as you can see, it sounds huge. Uh, you didn't need a lot of instruments for it. And it sounds massive. It sounds like, like a, a really big orchestra is performing this. So again, um, that's you don't need a lot of instruments to create such an epic part. Just keep that in mind. The less you use, the more clarity you're going to get in your mix. 
the more you use, the more detailed you need to be because you need to make sure that every instrument is heard and balanced in the frequency spectrum. So we're going to go ahead and look at what we have here in effects, uh, just so you can kind of see what I'm what I have here. Um, so a lot of it, I have it in folders. So let me just collapse them because I don't really. There's only a few that I that I did on 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 the actual channel strip, but for the most part, I only do it on the main folder. Um, so the harp, it just has the uh, virtual. Uh, mix rack from Slate Digital and all I'm doing is boosting the volume. Um, I liked how it sounded. Uh, same thing with the tremolo strings, just boosted the volume. Uh, I have nothing going on for the Hans Zimmer strings. They, they're just as is. And the Hans Zimmer string short, I do have the tape machine from Slate Digital to kind of give it that warmth analog uh, sound. And then we have the virtual mix rack where I have a, a, a mix bus. Uh, so a console preamp and then I have the uh, an EQ which is very interesting because this EQ specifically is very silky uh, it, it really doesn't aggressively change the frequencies it does it in a way where it's nice and smooth and but you really get the brilliance out of it um, so this is I think a really good EQ for your orchestra and then I have a uh, just kind of like a I call this like a mastering EQ kind of um, where you could just boost the lows and boost the highs. Uh, it's called thickness and shimmer. And you really get a nice beefy sound, but also with a nice silky high. So this is a perfect combination for your orchestral instruments because they do sound a little bit dull if you don't add a little bit of presence to it. So moving on to the brass, I kind of have the same thing. So the virtual tape machine, um, I have a little bit different. Uh, so let's see, we have a virtual mix bus, so the console pre. We have a more aggressive EQ. Uh, the FG Bomber is kind of, uh, it gives it a little, a lot, a lot of bit of mid range. So you're gonna get a lot of thickness in that mid range area. Notice how I have the tone set to fat. So I really want it to sound beefy, uh, which is how we get that end, uh, the, the end section there, how we get that nice beefy sound. I did add the uh, revival which is again like a master think of it as like a mastering uh, EQ where it only focuses on the lows and the highs and then I also use the custom series lift because here you can actually see that I have the silky um, uh, button pressed and then the punchy button pressed um, so it kind of gives the punchiness so that attack of it and then the silkiness I don't I'm only using a little bit of it so that's for the brass. Oh, and I forgot to mention the, I have like a, a compressor uh, just to kind of not slamming it. Okay, so I have it minus 6 dB and 2.5 and then an auto release. And then it's, you know, it's on the fast side, but I'm not really slamming it. Uh, so it doesn't squash the signal. You don't really want to squash uh, the signal out of orchestral instruments because then they lose dynamics. And that's pretty much it for that. And then for the percussion, same thing, a virtual tape machine I'm using the virtual mix rack with just the, the console pre and the FGN EQ, which is a pretty aggressive EQ. And then I have a compressor on this. Um, I am hitting it a little bit harder at 9.6, uh, negative 9.6. And then in my master track, uh, usually you would take it out, export it, put in a new project and do it there. But since this is just for Instagram and demo purposes, I just do it straight on the master track. So again, I have another virtual tape machine. I have the VMR. So this is the console pre and an EQ. So the, the nice silky EQ where I roll off a lot of the 400s and then boost a lot of the 12, a little bit of the 4K, and then uh, boost uh, a lot of bit of the 100K. But this might seem like a big boost but this EQ is not really an aggressive EQ. It's very smooth. So it looks like a lot, but it really isn't that much. Uh, but it sounds amazing. And we have the East Wet Spaces 2, I believe. And I'm using the Reynolds Basic Hall. And I have this pretty jacked up at tw negative 12 decibels just to kind of give an overall ambient, like if you're in a concert hall setting. And then we have the uh, compressor, again, just uh, kind of containing the sound again, not squashing it because again, it's at negative 4.5. So it's very, just very little bit. And I have it at 2.0 with an auto release. 
And then I have the limiter here from Slate Digital. And I'm using, again, the compressor here. I'm hitting this one a little bit harder at three. And then I have the threshold, and I get negative two something. Uh, and then I have the gain pot just below two. Because, again, we don't want to limit it all the way because you're going to ruin the dynamic range of these instruments. They're orchestral instruments, so you don't want to lose that dynamic range. All right, and that's pretty much it for the master track here, holding all these uh, all these plugins to make, again, the final product sound the way it does. Uh, so what's really important about orchestral, uh, I would say orchestral music in general, is uh, you don't really need that much processing to get it because uh, if you spend money on samples, on really good samples, they're pretty good outside the box. Um, but you have to remember that when they record samples, they don't really do any post-processing. Um, you kind of just get wherever the, the environment they recorded it in, and that's it. They don't really run through any EQ and stuff. So uh, what you really want to do when you get your orchestral instruments, and of course if you're taking this series, is you want to pay attention in you know, getting a little bit more presence in your mix. And by presence, I mean you know just kind of drawing out some EQs and raising the highs, you know, cutting out a little bit of the body because it kind of gets muddy in the 500, 400 range. It uh, gets a little bit of muddy, so I usually cut that out, which I did in the EQ. You saw in the 400s, I lowered it down uh, to kind of get clarity in the mix. And that's pretty much it. You really don't need to do much else. I, I add in a little bit more reverb just to kind of get a bigger hall sound, but that's it. And then, you know, just safety nets with compressors and stuff. I call it a safety net because I'm not really squashing the signal. It's just in case anything pops out. Uh, I, it just controls it and, and sl uh, not slams it down, but just kind of like pushes it down a little bit so it doesn't obviously uh, uh, make my signal clip. But that's pretty much it for orchestral mockups. So if you found the information of this video helpful, go ahead and hit the like button, subscribe, and don't forget to turn on notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly videos. If you have any questions throughout this video, please leave your comments down below and I'll get to them as soon as possible. Also, if you have any recommendations or you want me to talk about a specific topic, please let me know in the comment section below and I can go ahead and make a video to answer any questions you may have on any other topics besides the topic I spoke about in this video. So don't forget to share with your musician friends. I will see you all soon.